Okay, geometry, we're going to move on into chapter 6 now, which deals with uh, some polygons here we're going to be talking about. Most of chapter 6 is going to deal specifically with quadrilaterals, which we'll learn in just a moment as a four-sided polygon. So things you know and love already, like squares and rectangles and parallelograms. But at the beginning of chapter 6, we talk about polygons in general uh, with some things that are true for all polygons, not just the ones we're going to be focusing on later on in the chapter. So let's start with some vocab right here. We're going to begin with the word polygon itself. And so the definition we're going to write down for a polygon, everybody, is going to be a closed two-dimensional figure. So if you're not familiar with the phrase two-dimensional, uh, or if it's maybe something you've heard about but you're not entirely sure what it means, it's one of those strange things you're almost better thinking about something different, three-dimensional figures, uh, to, to draw the distinction. A three-dimensional object would be something like a, a basketball or a shoebox, that exists both in terms of length and width and height. But when we talk about something two-dimensional, we're basically talking about something flat. All right, so something like a single sheet of paper or uh, a circle, not a sphere, but a circle that's flat would be an example of something two-dimensional. So a polygon is a closed two-dimensional figure and the other thing we're going to add to it here is that a polygon needs to be completely made up of line segments. And the significance of that, everybody, is that you can't have any curved parts in a polygon. So for that reason, a circle is not a polygon because a circle, while it is a closed two-dimensional figure, is not made up of line segments. A circle is made up of a curve uh, or, or a series of, of points in an arc right there. So to be a polygon, it's got to be a closed two-dimensional figure, and it's got to be made up of line segments. So if we were just going to sketch a few examples, and we'll get to this here pretty soon, but uh, probably the simplest one you can draw would be a triangle. That is a closed figure, uh, meaning it's not open like this right here would be. So the one on the right is open. That is not a polygon. This one on the left, though, is closed. It's two-dimensional, meaning it's flat. It doesn't have any depth to it, and it's made up completely of line segments. Uh, things can get more complicated. Uh, eventually, we might start to draw something that looks like... Okay, not a very well-drawn figure, but that's a six-sided figure, uh, things like that. But uh, important to note that, for example, let me talk about this one right here, an ice cream cone type shape. That one is also not a polygon because it has a curve up there at the top. Okay, so... That would be uh, two examples right there on the right, uh, top right and bottom right, of closed figures or, or figures in general that are not polygons, whereas these two on the left are polygons. Okay, so that's our working definition of polygon. Next one I wanted to talk about was a regular polygon. And so, as I think you can tell, a regular polygon is, in fact, a polygon. So the definition that we wrote right here in Part A still applies. A regular polygon is still a closed two-dimensional figure made up of line segments. But the distinction here lies in the word regular. So our definition for regular polygon is going to be a polygon with, ooh, there we go, a polygon with all sides congruent. Okay, they all have to be the same length and all of its angles congruent as well. So to be a regular polygon, all of your sides have to be congruent and all of your angles have to be congruent. Anyway, uh, so that's where we are right now uh, with polygon and with regular polygon. Okay, moving up next, diagonal is one of these tricky words that, you know, you've certainly heard before in your life, but maybe not within a mathematical setting. So our definition of a diagonal, everybody, is going to be, sorry about that, is going to be a segment connecting. All right, and here's where it gets just a little bit tricky, everybody. A segment connecting two non-adjacent vertices. Uh, J, I don't think I spelled that right. Uh, yeah, let's try that again, Mr. Fontana. Non-adjacent, I was thinking of the next word right there, vertices in a polygon. 
And I feel like that's one we should probably stop for just a second and draw ourselves a picture for. Actually, let me go back to uh, that hexagon that I had drawn a little while ago here. Um, and if we wanted to draw a diagonal, what I think we probably ought to do is name a couple of our vertices here. Now, obviously, in this hexagon, there's six of them, but I'm just going to label three of them here. A and B and C. And what I want you guys to notice here is that vertices A and B are already connected by this line segment right here. B and C are already connected here as well. So A and B would be adjacent vertices. B and C would be adjacent vertices. But A and C are what we would consider to be non-adjacent vertices. They're not already connected. So if I were to draw the one and only line segment connecting those two points, then that segment right there in red, everybody, is what we call a diagonal in the polygon because it joins two vertices, A and C, that are not already connected. Now, there are more. Uh, I'm not going to name all of them, and I wonder how long it's going to take me to do, but those are three different diagonals that I just drew there in red that all come out of point A. Well, guess what? There's three coming out of point B. There's three coming out of point C, one, two, and the third one was already drawn there. And in fact, there's three coming out of every vertex in the polygon, but I think what I did there uh, represents all of them. So, Every polygon has a, a differing number of diagonals within it, and it has to do with the number of vertices. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but I don't think we need to dwell on that too much right now. So that's our definition of a diagonal. And the last two terms that I want to define here, guys, I think are pretty self-explanatory, interior angle and exterior angle. And uh, I don't even know that we need to... Um, to define these all that carefully because the names kind of tell you what they are. An interior angle, let me go back to a diagram here that we had just a second ago, and I think for this one I'll focus on that triangle that we drew up on top. An interior angle, like we've been dealing with with triangles for a while, guys, is an angle on the interior of a polygon. So, ooh, I knew that was going to happen. All right, let's get rid of all that. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so an interior angle might look something like this. So that's an interior angle. And then an exterior angle comes from extending one of the sides of the polygon past the vertex where it would normally end. And the exterior the angle then is going to be this guy out here. So that is our exterior angle. Notice, of course, that it's located outside of the polygon. So I don't think we probably need definitions for interior and exterior angle because I, I think the diagram helps and tells us what we need. One other thing that I did want to talk about with you guys here, although to be uh, honest with you, this is probably not something that you need uh, to put in your notes right here. There are two different types of polygons out there called convex and concave polygons. Now, for us, luckily, 99.9% .9 of the polygons that we are going to deal with are going to be convex polygons, these ones right over here. But concave polygons do exist as well, and I want to talk quickly about the difference between the two. Now, if you remember these words from science class, maybe in middle school, you learn about them a lot with lenses. Concave means that something is caved in, and convex kind of means that it's bulging out. Um, we're not going to bother trying to define this and write it down because the definition is so complicated um, that it doesn't really help you even to write it down. You, if I wrote it, you would put it in your notes and you'd go, uh, that doesn't really help me at all. But let me kind of show you a demonstration of what's going on here. You'll notice that I'm moving these two red points from outside of the first polygon to the interior of the polygon. And now, if I were to connect those two points with the line segment joining them, you'll notice that that entire line segment is contained inside of the convex polygon. That is kind of the definition or, or the hallmark of a convex polygon. If you can connect any two points that are inside the figure with a line segment that is also completely inside the figure, then your figure is convex. Now, if I move over here to the one on the right, the concave, you got to be careful about how you apply this definition because it is certainly possible to draw two points inside a concave polygon 
and connect them with a line segment and get that line segment to be completely contained within the figure. But the more important thing, everybody, is, is it possible to not do that? So what I think you're going to see here is if I were to move one of those points right over here and one of those points right over here, both of those points are still inside the polygon. And if I connect them with a line segment, you'll notice that that line segment, at least for a, a period of time, goes outside of the polygon. If you can make that happen, what we did right there, really, if you can make that happen, then your polygon is concave. It was impossible to make that happen over here on the left, which is why that first figure was convex. So that's a quick discussion about convex versus concave polygons. As I said, you guys, 99% of what we're dealing with is going to be convex, and we don't really need to concern ourselves very much with concave. Okay, little bit of vocabulary time now, everybody, talking about the names of polygons. In a normal year, I would tell you guys that these are names you're going to need to have memorized. Uh, but of course, uh, right now, if you have your notes handy, you're going to be fine just writing these down. A a lot of these you're going to find that you know already. A few of them, eh, you might learn something as we go through about the connection between math and then language, everybody. So here we go. You'll notice that in this, uh, this chart right here, the first column, we're, we're talking about n. That's a variable that's going to get used a lot. And that's representing the number of sides. And you'll notice, uh, for a good reason, we start this column with 3. The reason why, guys, it is impossible to have a one-sided polygon. If a polygon is a closed figure made up of line segments, then that one segment right there can't possibly be closed. So a one-sided polygon doesn't exist. You just end up drawing a line segment. And then if you try to draw a two-sided polygon, you end up with the same problem because the figure is not closed. So that's what it might look like if we tried to draw a two-sided polygon. But we can't really close the figure until we draw a third side over here. So the lowest number of sides we can ever have in a polygon is three. And as you've known probably since kindergarten, the name for a three-sided polygon is going to be a triangle. Now, if we break that down for just a moment, and pardon me, I know this sounds stupid, but the prefix tri means three, and angle obviously is referencing the number of angles that we have. So even though we're talking about sides here, the name triangle actually means three angles and not three sides. But lucky for us, a figure with three angles is guaranteed to also have three sides. Now, let's move on to the next one, four sides. And this is the first spot where people start to go a little bit astray in their reasoning. A lot of people want to tell me that the name of a four-sided polygon is a square. And what I've got to correct you guys on there is that while a square is in fact a four-sided polygon, you're right about that, not every four-sided polygon is a square. For example, if you were to put square in that chart over there on the right and then I were to draw that, well, then by the definition that you guys had provided, that would be a square, what I just drew, and that's clearly not the case. Not every four-sided polygon is a square or a rectangle or a parallelogram. So the very generic term that we use here, guys, and I don't know how familiar you guys uh, are with it right now, is a quadrilateral. And now let's play the name game a little bit more, guys. The prefix quad, as I think you guys know, means four, very similar to cuatro in Spanish, because, uh, of course, Spanish and Latin are more closely related even than English is uh, to Latin as well. And then the lateral right here, everybody, is a word we're going to use here a lot for side of a figure. So quadrilateral literally means four sides. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that quad is from a Latin root. That's why it's so similar to Spanish. And la uh, the lateral part, I believe, is from Latin as well. But now we do something very weird. Now for five-sided figures, and I think you guys very likely know this one as well, that is going to be a pentagon.
Not a pentalateral, but a pentagon. And here's where English gets really weird, all right? And I'm hoping you guys know this already, but one of the things that makes English a unique language and, going along with that, makes it one of the hardest languages to learn if you're not a native English speaker is that English doesn't just come from one language. English is really this kind of weird hybrid of Latin roots and Greek roots. And so what we were just talking about here with quadrilateral, quad means four in Latin, and lateral means side in Latin. But now all of a sudden, and I don't have a reason for you guys for why this is, the pent right there is a prefix that means five, but that comes from Greek. And gon, the G-O-N, uh, means side, but that also comes from Greek. So this is really, really strange. Quadrilateral means four sides, essentially taken from Latin. Pentagon means five sides, but that one is taken almost exclusively from Greek roots that make up English. So, you know, it's a little weird. It's a little inconsistent. You're not going to hear me arguing otherwise. Let's keep rolling, guys. A six-sided figure, you heard me use the phrase already, that is called a hexagon, everybody. This one is, again, based on Greek roots right there. Hex meaning six. Seven is an odd one. Apparently, the mathematical world couldn't quite decide which set of roots they wanted to follow. So there's actually two acceptable names here for a seven-sided figure. The Greek root right here that I think you guys can tell, heptagon, because it's very, very similar to hexagon, which came right above it. Or the other one here, septagon. S-E-P-T-A-G-O-N, that's the Latin version of a seven-sided figure. Not septilateral, uh, but septagon, so that one's kind of a, a strange one. Eight, only one word we use for this one, thankfully, and that is going to be an octagon. Nine is one you hardly are ever going to see or hear, but that is called a nonagon. Ten, Probably one you're not real familiar with, but that's going to be a decagon. And if you think about DEC, decade, everybody, uh, or decimal system, those are words that start with the same prefix of DEC uh, that always mean 10. 12 is an interesting one. I like this one a lot. This one is called a dodecagon. And if you think about where the number 12 comes from, it's 10 and 2 put together. Well, the do at the beginning of dodecagon, kind of sounds like dos in Spanish, which means two, and there's the D-E-C, the decagon, which means ten. So the two and the ten, dodecagon, get put together to make that. Um, one more fancy word for you here, 20 sides is called an icosagon. You may run across that word uh, from there on out. And you'll notice, guys, we skipped 11, and then I skipped all of 13 through 19. There are words for a 17-sided polygon or an 11-sided polygon. A, I don't know what they are. B, those types of polygons show up so rarely that we don't bother making you guys learn those words. So this last one we're going to do here is kind of a really generic one that for any number other than the ones listed in this chart above, we are simply going to call an n-sided polygon an n-gon. That's a little bit weird. So what does that mean? If I were to draw you a 37-sided polygon, rather than asking you to learn a name for that, we would simply call that a 37-gon. Not exactly poetic in the way that it sounds there, but that's what we're going to do for any numbers here other than the ones that you have, uh, have listed up above. And I do want to point out one more thing, everybody. My mom was an English teacher, and she'd get mad at me if I didn't mention this. I wonder if you guys didn't notice some of the prefixes here that started right here. Septagon. And the beginning of septagon, S-E-P-T, I was going to ask you guys if you knew any other words that started with those same really four letters. And what I'm hoping you guys notice is, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. What I'm hoping you guys notice there is that the month September begins with the exact same four letters. The weird thing about that is that September isn't the seventh month. September is the ninth month. And let's play that game a little bit further. O-C-T at the beginning of octagon is the beginning of October. 
which is the 10th month, not the 8th. The N-O at the beginning of Nanagon kind of looks like the start to November, the 11th month, not the 9th. And D-E-C, everybody, December is the beginning of the 12th month. And real quickly, not to dwell on this for too long, this used to make a ton of sense. Um, I'm not a history teacher. I just play one on TV. But I believe that it was the Romans uh, who established the 10-month calendar uh, and had a lot of the same month names more or less that we use today. So back in the Roman times, September was in fact the seventh month of their year. October was the eighth month, November was the ninth, and December was the tenth, which makes a ton of sense. But I believe at some point during the Roman reign of power there for, what, a thousand years or so, somebody decided that a 12-month calendar was going to work a little bit better. So what did the Romans do? They added two months. And if you know the names of some prominent figures in Roman history, I think you know where these months were. The month July was named after Julius Caesar, and then the month of August was named after Caesar Augustus, two of the most uh, uh, prominent and well-known uh, emperors in, uh, in Rome there. And they decided to put those months in the middle of the year, which bumped everything else back two months. So September, which was the seventh month, now became the ninth month. Month. October, which was the eighth month, now became the tenth month, and so on and so forth. And that's why we have a system of naming our months now that makes very little sense. All right, guys. So those are all of the polygon names that you guys are going to be responsible for knowing. Anything beyond that, we're just going to go with that generic n-gon method that we discussed here a moment ago. Okay, so with that in mind, guys, let's move on. Let's start doing some math now. A couple of theorems here in section 6.1. And the first theorem here is called the polygon angle sum theorem. And I do think it's worth noting that this applies to the interior angles in a polygon. And I already wrote in any polygon, but I probably should be a little bit more specific and say in any, and here's back to those words we talked about a while ago, in any convex polygon. What I'm about to tell you guys doesn't apply to concave polygons, but lucky for us, uh, we decided then that we were going to deal exclusively with convex polygons, so that's why we don't really need to write this out all that carefully. All right, guys, and the formula here says that in any convex polygon, let me explain this notation, the S right there stands for sum, and the little I subscript is for interior. So this means that in any convex polygon, the sum of our interior angles is going to be the product of 180 multiplied by the quantity n minus 2. So that is our formula here, guys, for the sum of the interior angles in any convex polygon. 180 times n minus 2. Quick explanation. Let's start with the simplest polygon we can come up with, which is a triangle. Well, we already know that the sum of the interior angles in any polygon is equal to 180. That's something we've known for months. But if we think about a quadrilateral, oh, like maybe a rectangle or so, what we're going to do, guys, is I'm going to draw one diagonal just one, down the middle of that rectangle. And what you'll notice now is that we've cut that rectangle up into two triangles. And in each of those triangles, the sum of your interior angles is 180 degrees. So in this case, you've got two triangles that are formed, each one with a sum of 180. So this is 180 degrees times two triangles here, which gets you a total of 360 degrees within that original quadrilateral. Now back up to where we were in the triangle, there was only one triangle that you could draw inside a triangle. That sounded dumb to say. So that's how you ended up with the 180. Let me do a third example. This will be the last one. But if we were to draw a pentagon, not a very good pentagon, Mr. Fontana, but if I were to pick one vertex and draw both of the diagonals that come down from that vertex, well, what do we see? There's a triangle on the left with a sum of 180 a triangle in the middle that's 180, and a triangle on the right that's 180 as well. So here, the sum of your interior angles would be 180 times 3 triangles. And that 180 times 3 is going to get us 540 degrees. 
Now, we could keep doing this over and over, but the point there is that based on the number of sides that you're dealing with, like, for example, in a triangle where the number of sides is three, we were only able to make one triangle. In a quadrilateral where the number of sides is four, we were able to make two triangles. In a pentagon, where the number of sides was five, we were able to make three triangles. So the number of triangles you're going to be able to create is always going to be two less than your overall number of sides. And that's where the formula of 180 times n minus 2 comes from. All right, all right, so let's see that idea at work here, guys. So our first example, find the sum of the interior angles in a dodecagon. Well, the first thing you're going to have to do is get pretty well acclimated with this table right here and know the names of your polygons. And in case you'd forgotten it already, a dodecagon is right down here. That is a 12-sided figure. So probably the first thing you ought to do is write that fact down, that in a dodecagon, we're dealing with 12 sides. So something we are going to do a lot of here in the second semester, everybody, is start writing out formulas. The sum of your interior angles is 180 times n minus 2. All right, step number two, after you've written out the formula, fill in what you know. The only variable here is n, and we just said that in a dodecagon, the number of sides, n, is going to be 12. So we'll do a 12 minus 2 here, and at this point, guys, there's no harm in just going directly to your calculator and typing this expression in the, exactly the way it looks. But if you did want to do it by hand, you would do the parentheses first, that 12 minus 2 is going to give you 10, and 180 times 10 is going to be 1,800 degrees for the sum of all 12 interior angles in a dodecagon. So that's how you do a problem like that, everybody. We start with the formula, we fill in what we know, and then we evaluate the expression or solve the equation, whatever it is that we needed to do in that example. That wasn't too bad. All right, this one is a similar problem, but just a little bit more complicated here. Let's see what's going on in this one. Find the measure, this is important now, you guys, of each interior angle in a regular dodecagon. So we're still talking about a dodecagon. It's still going to be the case here that n is equal to 12, but the word regular now popped in right here. And if we go back to our definition of what a regular polygon was, a regular polygon was one with all sides congruent and all angles congruent. And that last part is important here, guys. And all angles are congruent in a regular polygon. So what we learned in this first example is that the sum of the 12 interior angles in any decagon is always 1,800 degrees. So I'm going to go ahead and write that again. Okay, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. We know this already. The sum of your interior angles is 1,800 degrees. But now, and I don't suppose I have a tool here, do I, to be able to draw? No. If I had the full version of this, I could do it. Sorry, guys. Uh, I can't draw you a dodecagon. But the important thing here is that all 12 of these angles are going to be congruent to each other. So if we wanted to find the measure of just one, that's a, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mr. Fontana, ugly. All right, let's try that again. You go away, you come here. If we wanted to find the measure of just one interior angle, we would take the sum of your interior angles and divide it by the number of interior angles you're dealing with. So we know that our sum in a dodecagon is 1,800 degrees, and we're dividing that by the number of sides in a dodecagon, that's n, which is 12. And when we go to our calculator here, that one, uh, 1,800 divided by 12, I do believe is going to get us 150 degrees for the measure of each one of those interior angles. I'm just verifying that right now. Yeah, that's right. So the measure of each interior angle in a regular dodecagon is going to be 150 degrees. Okay, so that in mind, only one other thing I want to do with you, one third example to do right here. You're going to see some problems like this on your homework, so I thought we would do one where they're going to ask you to solve for why. So the first thing you're going to have to do is figure out what in the world we are looking at right here. What polygon is this? So what most people want to do here is count sides. You certainly can, but uh, you'd be surprised how often people get that wrong. What I'm going to do instead is count angles. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, and don't forget the Y, we have seven angles right here. Seven angles means we also have seven sides. So I'll write that down right away. N, the number of sides here, is seven. That means we're dealing with a heptagon or a septagon, however you want to say it. And in order to pull this off, we're going to need to know the sum of all seven of those interior angles. So again, my formula here is 180 times n minus 2. Fill in what we know then. The sum of the interiors is 180. n we said is 7 minus 2. So the sum of all of our interiors, that becomes a 180 times 5. That means that the seven of those angles all added together are going to add up to 900 degrees. Now, how does that help us? Well, let me switch colors on you here now, guys. Uh, let's see. We did that. We did that. We'll go to a lovely shade of green on this one here. It's going to be kind of fluorescent, maybe hard to read. Now that we know that the sum of all of these uh, angles added together is 900, this actually becomes a problem just like we dealt with back in the first semester with triangles, where you would make an equation where you add up the measures of all three angles and set that sum equal to 180. Well, in this case, that sum is going to be 900. So I'm going to start with the y, and then I'm just going to proceed in a clockwise direction from there, which is going this way. So y plus 110 plus 140 plus 95 plus 100 plus 110 plus 120, who that's a lot, would have to equal our total here of 900 degrees. Now, it, it took a long time to write, but this is not a complicated equation to solve. We are going to combine our like terms here from the six angles whose measures were given to us. So I'm just grabbing my calculator here, guys, and I'm adding up 110 plus 140 plus 95 plus 100 plus 110 plus 120, and that got us, oh, I remember not liking this problem, and now I remember the reason why. Anyway, did I do that right? I think so. Y plus 675 degrees equals that 900 over here on the right. Now, we would just subtract a 675 from both sides. Those cancel, and we would get y equals, and here's why I don't like this problem, the 900 minus the 675 leaves us with something that unfortunately is not realistic. 225 degrees is the measure that I came up with for that angle right there. That's not possible, everybody, because that angle has to be smaller than 180. So Mr. Fontana goofed up, and that's really a problem that I should change at some point. Anyway, the way it was written, that's the answer that we came up with. I promise I'll fix that and make it look a little bit better and a little, a little more realistic if that were to show up on a quiz or a test. All right, guys, so those last three examples all dealt with the triangle, excuse me, the polygon interior angle sum theorem. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit and move on to theorem 6-2, which is the polygon exterior angle sum theorem. And you guys are going to like this one a lot better because there's no real formula here. This is one of the easiest things we will learn all year. The sum, again, let me explain my notation now. The S means the sum and the little subscripted E means exterior. The sum of the exterior angles in any convex polygon, regardless of the number of sides, is always 360 degrees. No exceptions to that, guys. The sum of your exteriors is always 360. So I just wanted to walk you through a few of these right here. If we were to talk about what, what's happening here, take a look at this triangle that I drew in. And not all triangles work this way, but, but just this one here. But anyway, what do we have here, guys? If we were to extend this one side out here, we've got an exterior angle here. 60 degrees on the interior angle. This is 120 degrees for the exterior. And now if I kept going in the same direction, there's a 120 degree angle here and a 120 degree angle here. And if we were to add together those three, the 120 times three, that gets us a sum of 360 degrees 
just like this little theorem said uh, we were going to have happen. How about in a rectangle, guys? All of those angles are 90. So if we were to walk around that thing, we've got a 90 degree angle here because 90 plus 90 is 180. Here's a 90 degree angle exterior. Here's a 90 degree exterior. And here's a 90 degree exterior. So in this case, that's 90 times 4, which equals 360 as well. OK, that's where we're at. And the same thing happens over here. Uh, these all end up being 72 degree angles. Take my word for that one, guys, in a pentagon. And the 72 times 5, guess what? That's going to get us 360 degrees also. OK, so one quick example and let's get out of here. This one's interesting, guys. Find the measure of each interior and each exterior angle in a regular nonagon. OK, so first thing to realize, go back to your chart if you need it, but in a nonagon, everybody, n is equal to 9. OK, so we know we're dealing with a nine-sided figure. And we actually did something like this back in this example right here. Find the measure of each interior angle in a regular dodecagon. So what did we do? We found the sum of the interior angles first, then we applied this little formula. And that method would absolutely work here, but I actually want to show you guys what I think is a good way to do this problem. I actually want to do the exterior angles. Ah, oh, dang gummit. I actually wanted to do the exterior angles here first because I think those are much easier to deal with. So let me work on this right over here. In an exterior, when we're dealing with exterior angles, we know already that the sum of the exteriors, because of that theorem we just discussed, is always 360 degrees. Therefore, the measure of one exterior angle is going to be 360 divided by n the number of sides that you're dealing with. Well, in this example, n is 9. So each exterior here is going to be 360 divided by 9. That means that the measure of one exterior angle in a regular nonagon would have to be 40 degrees. And now, probably the easiest thing to realize is that in one quick, tiny little step, we can get the measure of an interior without having to bother to find the sum here, which is a little bit harder with interiors. All we need to remember, guys, is that in any polygon, and I'm not going to draw all of it, just a little bit of a polygon, you've got an interior angle right here and an exterior angle right here. And as I think you guys can see, Right here, everybody, the interior and the exterior angles form a linear pair. We know that no matter how many sides we're dealing with, the measure of one interior angle plus the measure of its corresponding exterior angle has to be 180. And we already know here that the measure of each exterior angle in this figure is 40 degrees. So an interior plus 40 has to equal 180. So we would just subtract the 40 from both sides here, guys. This is pretty darn easy. Those cancel out, and we will get that an interior angle, each interior angle here, is 140 degrees. And that's the measure of each interior angle in a regular nonagon. OK, everybody, that is all the news that's fit to print here on Section 6.1. So I think that's going to help you get through your homework there. So give that a shot. And if you have any questions on those, come see me in office hours or post a question in the comments section on that assignment on Classroom. Good luck, everybody.